Uh, welcome everyone to this debate today. I'd like to just first of all open up this discussion in prayer before we do begin anything. So, dear God, we thank you for your grace, your love and your mercy. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and everything that you have given for us. I thank you for bringing us here today to discuss this issue, God, a very important issue. And I thank you for watching over our lives and keeping us in good health and giving us so many things in which we don't deserve. I thank you so much for everything that you've given to each and every one of us today and for keeping us alive and healthy and here today. We pray today, God, that truth will come to light and God, that you will reveal the truth to those who are listening, to those who are participating, etc. We pray that this discussion will lead to a glorification of your name, O God. And it's in Jesus' mighty name I pray and give thanks to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm your moderator for today's debate, Alexander Green. I'd, I'd like to start off by thanking God, as I just did, for bringing us together to discuss such a vital issue and to thank the participants for taking the time out of their day to take part in this debate. Today's debate is on the topic, is Jesus the Father? And this is oneness theology versus Trinitarian theology. The Trinitarian position states that there is one God who exists as three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, oneness theology states that God is both ontologically and in persons that God is unipersonal, that God is one. Oneness theology states that God is absolutely and indivisibly one, and it is Unitarianism. Our oneness participant tonight will argue the affirmative that Jesus is the Father. Meanwhile, our Trinitarian participant tonight will be arguing the negative that Jesus is not the Father. Representing the oneness side is oneness apologist Brandon Nero. Uh, Brandon, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, yes. Thank you, Alexander. My name's Brandon. I am a native of Mobile, Alabama. I'm an ordained minister in the United Pentecostal Church, Alabama District. I'm married to my wife, Kavisha, of nine years. We have my only begotten son, Breland, Alexander Zachariah Nero. I have a bachelor's in business, master's in business administration. I will have my doctorate in business at men, and I have a foundational certificate in biblical studies from the Purpose Institute. I'm glad. Okay. And representing the Trinitarian side tonight is Trinitarian apologist Isaiah Shaw. Isaiah, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I am Isaiah Shaw. I have been a Christian apologist for about uh, six years now. Um, I am I'm a I'm a dilettante I'm a dilettante at this. I admit, and I've also um, I've learned just uh, pretty much self taught when I've done this. So uh, yeah. Um, I look forward to a very in, engaging discussion, and I think it will be very edifying to everybody here. Um, and that's that's really all I have. That's all. Okay, so the format for tonight's debate will be as follows: fifteen-minute opening statements, ten-minute rebuttals, two ten-minute cross-examination periods each, twenty-minute audience questions and answers and five minute closing statements. And a few rules I'd like to remind everyone of. Uh, participants, please do not use your rebuttal period as another opening statement, but use it to rebuttal what your opponent has said. Also allow your opponent to respond in the cross-examination period and try not to take your answers off topic or ask questions off topic. And when we have our audience questions, we will turn on hand raising and pick audience members to come up and ask questions. If you are selected to ask a question, please ask only one question and do not speak after unless a participant asks you to clarify your question. Please keep your questions under a minute. I can't uh, uh, stress that enough that the questions have to be under a minute for time purposes. And please keep your questions on topic. With that being said, gentlemen, please keep this debate respectful. And Brandon, as you're arguing the affirmative, you will begin this debate with your opening statement. So please let me know when you'd like me to begin your 15 minutes. All right. Can you guys hear me still? 
Yep. Good stuff. I am ready when you are. Okay. Here we go. And again, good evening. I greet you all in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. I thank him for being here and having an opportunity to present what I believe to be a biblical understanding of the nature of God. I will give a quick summary of what we believe as oneness Pentecostals or more commonly called in theological vernacular apostolics. The beautiful message of scripture is that our creator became our savior. The God against whom we sinned is the one who forgives us. He is the God who loved us so much that he came in flesh to save us from ourselves. He gave himself, becoming intimately involved in his creation. Moreover, our creator, Savior, is also the indwelling spirit who is ever present to help us. The very God that told us how to live came and lived among us. He showed us how to live in the flesh and laid down his human life to purchase our salvation. And now within the dispensation of the church, he abides within our hearts as the Holy Ghost. My disclaimer before I go into my polemical proofs for the reality of that there is one personal God revealed in Christ Jesus. I want to communicate that my motive for this debate is not to win or to bring embarrassment or to position someone in a light that is not flattering. It is simply to express and to encourage what I believe to be the most profitable endeavor, the study of God's word. So I will assume the affirmative position as a oneness Pentecostal, and this proposition will be uh, entitled or is entitled for this room. Jesus is the father incarnate. Although many verses of scripture declare Jesus Christ to be the God of the Old Testament manifested in a human nature for the purpose of self-revelation and reconciliation, I will illustrate this biblical truth by providing three polemical proofs demonstrating my assertion. The first will be that the scriptures teach that God eternally exists as one singular in nature and self-aware person that is in nature a spirit being who is the creator of all things. Because of this biblical witness, we are left with no other option, understanding that God inconsistently and strongly wants us to understand that he is not a polypersonal being. What better place to start with this endeavor to discover the God of the Bible than the very first book of the Bible in the first chapter of the Bible at the very first verse of the Bible? The scriptures or the word of God would declare very clearly in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What you will notice is that the word for God here comes from the Canaanite word that originates as Elohim. Elohim by nature was the Canaanite word that meant the Greek pantheon of gods. So when it was adopted into the Hebrew language as the word to communicate that which is divine, it still carried its plural structure, but it is the made uh, its difference by the use of the verb being singular or plural. You will notice that the word for created is the word bara, meaning that this in this word, it is a singular verb, masculine verb. To communicate to us that it was not a multiplicity of gods, it was not a multiplicity of persons, but it was a singular God that was involved in the creation of the world. This very self same author that is present in the book of Genesis, who is the same man Moses articulates this truth once more for us so that we can have ontological clarity in what is considered the crowning jewel of biblical monotheism, Deuteronomy 6 and 4. The word of the Lord would read, Shema Ya Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Many would take this to mean that when the scripture declares that God is one, that it is simply stating that God is one in essence or that God is one in purpose. But here we find the same interesting habit of the one true God being identified as singular with the word Akkad. Some way may propose that the very reason that the word Akkad is used there is because it's trying to communicate a plurality. I would politely disagree. I do believe that this word is communicating to us not the fact that God is by himself because we know the angels were with him when he created all things, but the very fact that God is unique within his being. The second polemical proof that I will use to demonstrate my understanding tonight will be, will be based upon Genesis uh, 1 
and one, and of course, Deuteronomy six and four. But we will find our basis based in Isaiah 64 verses eight through nine. The word of the Lord would read. But now, O Yahweh, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. And we are all the work of your hands. Do not be very sorely angry, O Yahweh, nor remember iniquity forever. Behold, look, we beg you, we are all your people. What the prophet Isaiah communicates to us is that we can extract some very important principles from this verse. The first is that Yahweh, the singular God that was identified as the same one who was present at creation, the same one that personally created all things, that this same Yahweh is our father. Yahweh is not only the father, father but he is the potter. He is the one with his own hands personally, not contracting another person, but personally creating us to be in his image. Yahweh made us with his own hands and with his own intellect and his own skills so that we can reflect the one who created us. This is further proved by going to Galatians 3 and 20 in the uh, Amplified uh, version of the Bible, the classic version of the Amplified, that reads, now a go-between has to do with and implies more than one party. There can be no mediator with just one person, yet God is only one person. And he was the sole party in giving that promise to Abraham. But the law was a contract between two, God and Israel, and its validity was dependent on both. Finally, I conclude with the third part of my polemic tonight centered around that if in this triadic uh, polemic that I have presented for everyone's learning tonight, that we want to understand that this same God that was present in creation, that was present in every monumental aspect of human life, is the same God that we understand visited mankind by incarnating himself in an authentic human reality as the man Christ Jesus. This can be verified by going to St. John 14, verse 5 through 14. The scripture would read, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father by me. If you had known me, you should have known my father, Patera, which is the Greek word for father also. And from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. Some would say that when you see me, you have seen my father is simply a reference to the fact that a child resembles their father. I could say that, yes, when you see my son Breland, he looks like me. And unfortunately, at times he acts like me. But when you see him, it is not the same as saying that you identify me. If my son within class would go up in front of the whole class and say, I'm going to show you my father. Then my son would go to say that, hey, when you've seen me, you've seen my father. I want to let you know that they will probably be removing my son from the class and probably be assisting him to use a much shorter bus to go to school. But when we find the question of Philip to be legitimate. Because if he understood the father to be someone else from Jesus, this would be the exact understanding or the exact question he would ask. He goes on to verse eight to say, Philip said unto, unto him, Lord, show us the father and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you? And yet thou hast not known me, Philip. He that has seen me hath seen the father. And how sayest thou then show us the father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Well, who's speaking the words or causing these things to take place? But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. The works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus has communicated a truth to us that I believe should not be ignored. 
a truth that will serve to be not only of the bedrock for what we understand, for what we ascribe to, but will be the exact key to deliverance in our life. I will conclude uh, early with my time tonight uh, with Revelation 21 and 7. Jesus gives the most, the most astounding promise to the overcomers in the book of Revelation. He promises that to him that overcomes, that to him, I will be his God and he shall be my son. Obviously, Jesus understood the dichotomy that he was making. Jesus understood the connection to the father that he was making. And my presentation tonight is hinged on one simple truth. We should believe the testimony of Jesus Christ. I believe that we must embrace him, not for the parts that simply align with our ideology, but we shall embrace him for who he exactly is, which is the great God of glory manifested in a true human identity. And I yield uh, the rest of my time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brandon. And that's with four minutes to spare. Isaiah, let me know when you would like me to start your 15 minute opening statement. Um, okay, so I'll start right now. Praise be to the God and Father of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the power of his Holy Spirit. Thank you all for attending this debate. So first and foremost, I am a Christian monotheist. I believe in one God only. The distinction between my opponent and myself is that I am a Trinitarian monotheist. By this we mean there are three hypostases, or persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who share in the homoousia, or the same nature. The Son and Spirit eternally proceed from the Father. They never had a beginning to their existence. The Son's nature is the Father's nature, and the Spirit's nature is the Father's nature. There was never a time, a time when the Father, Son, and Spirit were not who they are. Now, to answer the question, is Jesus the Father? The answer, according to the Bible, is definitely no. The oneness modalist belief hinges on the notion that the Son had to have come into existence at a point in time and that the Son is a role the Father takes on when entering creation. The nature of who the Son is is vital because 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 states, Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Therefore, I submit to you that if we are to abide in the Son, then this Son cannot be a mere creature, but must be the eternal Son of the living God, rather. So it stands to reason that if we can prove that Jesus has eternally existed as the Son, and when I say existed, I mean literally existed alongside his Father, not as a mere concept or plan the Father had, then we thus refute oneness theology. Likewise, if we can show scripture where oneness theology would be absolutely nonsensical, we would also thus refute oneness theology. Now then, I bring us to the most commonly used scripture by oneness believers. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Pelejoes, Wonderful Counselor, El Gibor, Mighty God, Aviad, Father of Eternity, Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. Is Jesus to be understood as the person of the Father from this passage? Absolutely not. The assumption made here by oneness believers is that Father in its New Testament usage is identical to its usage here. This is a case of an equivocation fallacy, which is an informal fallacy resulting from the use of a particular word or expression in multiple senses throughout an argument leading to a false conclusion. For example, a cow has four legs and a table has four legs, Therefore, a table is a cow. Or, Adam is the father of humanity, and God is the father of humanity, therefore Adam is God. The way in which they experience these qualities are different and does not make them identical. Saying that Jesus is God and the Father is God, therefore Jesus is the Father, is falling into this very fallacy. What's actually interesting is that this scripture works in favor of my position, when the text distinguishes between the child born and the son given. This demonstrates that the human nature was created, but the Son himself was given. This, as well as my other arguments, are far more coherent concerning the nature of the Son than my opponent's denial of eternal sonship. 
Now for my next scripture, I bring us to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the Ionios. Notice, the Ionios. This means the ages. The son created time itself. This alone would show eternal sonship, as well as the eternal fatherhood, seeing that the son is a relational term that implies fatherhood, but we can get clearer than that as we read further. Verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his hypostasis, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Notice, he is the exact imprint of the Father's substance and upholds the universe. The Father's substance is eternal. What would that make the Son's substance? Eternal. How could this make any sense under a simultaneous modalist position? If it is indeed the case that the Son's substance is created, we would be stuck with an eternally existent creation, which is a contradiction. Moreover, in verses 8 through 12, we see the Father speaking with regards to the Son. It says in verse 8, But of the Son... Your throne, O God, Hatheos, is forever and ever. The scepter of, right, of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, Kuri, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. Question, if the Son is simply the human nature that the Father took on at a point in time, how can he be eternal and have created the heavens and the earth and the ages? And are you seriously going to argue that a created man is who upholds the universe by the word of his power? Denial of eternal sonship results in an exalted creature acting as God. Congratulations, oneness belief is theological seppuku. Apologies for being so candid, but for a topic like this, I must be. How about we have a look at the Old Testament? Surely we do not hear of a son existing eternally with God in the Old Testament, right? Wrong. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 3. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One, Adoshim. This is a plural participle. When paired with singular verbs, it gets translated as a singular. Verse 4. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Notice, not what will his son's name be. And this is describing the son just as incomprehensible as the God Agur is speaking of. One might say, but Isaiah, this does not say Jesus is that son. And yes, it may not say that specifically, but if anybody can exegete scripture, it would certainly be Jesus. As he says in John chapter 3, verse 13, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. We'll return to the Gospel of John, but for now, we'll move forward. Let's read Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, more faith you, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To us Trinitarians, this makes perfect sense. The Son, who is clearly a distinct person from the Father, submits to his Father, and Paul is relating to the readers how we ought to have the same spirit of humility and obedience that Jesus displayed. Let's now read it with the lens of Jesus being the Father. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with himself a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself to himself by becoming obedient to himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, he has highly exalted himself and bestowed on himself the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of himself.
the Father. The oneness view of Jesus completely mutilates his humble, selfless nature and makes him into a narcissistic showboater with this strange penchant for putting on one-man shows. This isn't merely fruit inspecting to make sure people are on their P's and Q's for their theological vocabulary, folks. This is something that alters the very fabric of the gospel message and who God is. And it is my prayer that Brandon and all people in oneness theology will see the error of this point of view and will repent and believe on the triune God of Scripture. Let us continue. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens opened up to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Here at Jesus' baptism, all three persons of the Trinity are present. The Son, emerging out of the water. The Holy Spirit of Yahweh, descending upon him like a dove. And finally, the out loud proclamation of the Father declaring that Jesus is his very own Son in whom he is well pleased. Beautiful showing of the Trinity. However, according to oneness modalist doctrine, this was all just crafty trickery by Jesus to make it appear as if he is a different person from the Spirit and Father. This was apparently Jesus' divine nature calling out how pleased he is of his human nature while I guess his other divine nature descended upon his human nature. This is the absurdity of oneness theology. In fact, we can actually show how the oneness belief makes Jesus an outright liar. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. So Jesus just deceived this believing woman by acting as if he is not the Father. If he's supposedly just speaking in his humanity, why not just tell her that he can't do it right now, but when he returns to his divine form, he'll be able to do something, uh, do it, or something even remotely along the lines. Or even a flat out no. It's almost as if Jesus actually isn't his own father. Let's give another example. John chapter 5, verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does also. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son, does not honor the Father who sent him. So to us Trinitarians, there is no problem here. Jesus Christ is not a renegade God who is independent from the Father, and the Father is leaving judgment to the second person of the Trinity. For the oneness believer, however, you can only really go one of two ways here. Either A... Jesus lied, and the Father does in fact judge all of humanity, since he is the Father. Or B, Jesus said that an exalted creature gives life, and is who mankind will ultimately answer to. Either way you go, Jesus was being dishonest. There's also the problem of Jesus' location relative to the Father. John chapter 14, verse 28. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. If it is the case that Jesus is the Father, how on earth is it possible for him to be somewhere the Father is not? Also, how in the world can the Father be greater than himself at any point? We then have another major problem. John chapter 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give uh, eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. What is happening here? So did this created human man just proclaim his divine nature that he has eternally existed with him in heaven as God? And I thought the Father is Jesus. So who is this other only true God Jesus is speaking to when the Father is supposedly Jesus? 
These distinctions constantly being made are quite devastating to my opponent's Christology. This brings us to our final scripture. Revelation chapter 5 verse 11. Then I looked and I heard around the throne of the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. For us, these are two of the divine persons that are the one God getting their just due worship in heaven. Under oneness theology, we have God sitting next to this created human who is not another divine person and having creation worship him with his glory. The same God who in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8 proclaims that he shares his glory with none. Oneness theology is idolatry. There's a plethora of other texts that refute oneness doctrine, but it is up to my opponent to deal directly with the issues that have been presented and elucidate how Jesus could possibly be the person of the Father in the face of all of that without the use of equivocation and without fallaciously presupposing a unipersonal God. Repent and believe on the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which is Trinitarian. And that is my time. And that is literally with seven seconds to spare. Good timing. Well, Brandon, let me know when you'd like me to start your 10 minute rebuttal. Okay, uh, you can start now. Well, again, I am thankful for my uh, colleague's presentation of his understanding of what he believes the scripture to be saying. Uh, he listed quite a few. And for the sake of time, I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to give all of them the detail that I would like, perhaps. And the cross-examination, we'll have an opportunity to uh, discuss these for clarification. Uh, because I didn't quote Isaiah 9 and 6, I will uh, let Mr. Shaw hold that until that time. But I will go over a few scriptures. First, let's start with the book of Hebrews, the first chapter. And uh, the first verse would read, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. It is most important to understand that the context of the book of Hebrews is dealing with the aspect of Christ being much better than the Old Testament Levitical laws and sacrifices and all of those things. Uh, and so in verse two, hath in these last days spoken to us uh, by his son. What is most striking in verse two, it makes it very clear that it is in the last days that he has spoken to us by his son. This would mean quite clearly that if he is speaking to us now by his son, it is safe to assume that he wasn't speaking to us then by his son, or else what would be the difference in this time period and the time period before? The Bible goes on to say, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. The first thing that we have to understand here is that, and I understand the position will be that this is a, probably a claim to the economic trinity, but think about it. Does God have to be appointed to something? Just, I just want you to think about that because the context of Hebrews is dealing with the man Christ Jesus and by whom he made the worlds and my opponent, he definitely brought out aeons, meaning ages. I believe that it is through his incarnation and in his life that God made the ages. Verse three, who being the brightness of his glory, who is the glory of the one that this brightness is coming from? This is the father's glory in the Old Testament. The concept of glory is figurative or always underlines the idea of something that's related to God. Let's go a little bit further. Verse four gives a problem for Trinitarianism, in my understanding, being made so much better. Now, for to be God, according to the biblical definition, you can't have a beginning or an end. Uh, so in this instance, it says, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto whom other angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day, this day. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. 
And again, when he bringeth the firstborn into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. What we must notice, starting with verse six, is that it is starting to quote Psalms 97, verse seven, uh, from the Septuagint to be specific. We have, again, the psalmist is speaking. I have to ask this, if at verse six, if this is the father speaking, why would he say, let all the angels of God worship him? Verse seven. And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angel spirits uh, and his ministers a flame of fire. That's a reference uh, again to Psalms. And now he's speaking the third person at verse eight. This is probably one of the areas of I feel a great deal of misunderstanding as it relates to the oneness understanding. But unto the son, he saith. Now, what we must ask ourselves, who is doing the talking at this point? Is this the father talking? Is this still uh, uh, some some indication of a eternal conversation that the father had with the preexistent uh, eternal son? But unto the son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. First question that we must ask when he says thy throne, O God. Understanding that this is the psalmist get, talking about a royal wedding. He's given the context of uh, how a king is anointed. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Some will probably say, when I ask this question, is that a rhetorical question? Are you being funny? But does God really have a God? And if God has a God, wouldn't that make it multiple gods? Not asserting that that is my opponent's position. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. It is quite clear he is talking to the Son. He is speaking of the human nature of the man Christ Jesus. They shall perish. But thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt uh, thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Uh, we will visit that a little bit more. I will go to the next scripture. Let's go to Philippians, and I know my time is uh, uh, waning a little bit, and I want to make sure that I'm staying on course with that. I believe this is a thank you. I believe this is a common scripture that is uh, used to assert that this must mean that we have an eternal God. Philippians, the second chapter. Again, the context of Philippians 2 is dealing with humility. He is encouraging his listeners to take on the same humility that Jesus Christ in his true humanity exemplified on his life on earth. He goes on to say, look not at verse four on uh, every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. This is what he is proposing that his listeners should have the same mind. What mind? The mind that was in that was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God. Now, wait a minute. Who is the form of God? The son is the form of God. He is the more faith than you. Uh, in Hebrews, the first chapter, it talks about Jesus being the character of the invisible God. God cannot be seen. Therefore, the only way to see him is for him to stamp and to press his essence through some medium or source, which would be the genuine humanity. But the writer in Philippians 2 tells us that I want the same mind to be in you, who being in the form of God, who being in the form of God, that Christ Jesus was the form. One of the biggest errors I see in interpretation is for someone to take the form of God to make it the same as the substance of God. I will present to you, dear listeners, that this is not the case. But let's listen further. Uh, he thought it not robber to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and giving him a name that is above every name. We must ask ourselves consistently and clearly, is this presenting to us something that we have not already understood 
from the previous witnesses of scripture. The Trinitarian perspective in this will propose that this is obviously a reference to the pre-existent Christ taking on flesh, making himself uh, in a way that's lesser than his divine nature. The question that I will ask is, what did he empty himself of? Did he really empty himself of divinity? And if he emptied himself of divinity, would that make him God if he came down not as God and just, so to speak, as a spiritual being? I yield the rest of my time. Okay, thank you. And that is with one minute to spare. Isaiah, if you'd like to start your 10 minute rebuttal, let me know when you want to start. Uh, okay, so I will start with his opening statement. So um, I, I would just like to address the, the first things he said. So Genesis chapter one, verse one, that's a fantastic text, actually. It is one of the first in supporting God being multipersonal. Uh, is the word for God, Elohim, plural or singular? It is plural, yet it is used with singular verbs. Hmm, a God who is both plural and singular in his existence. If only there were a theological viewpoint that did espouse God to be that way. Oh, wait, there is. It's called the Trinity. Uh, but likewise, what my opponent misses, and I, I'm surprised, but... Uh, in addition to Genesis 1, I, I know this didn't come up, uh, but it's definitely connected to, uh, to Genesis 1, so I have to mention it. Uh, John 1 states that the word of God who became flesh was present during this time as God, as well as being uh, he was God, and he's also present with God. And Hebrews 1 likewise states that Jesus eternally existed as God with his Father. We'll address more of that uh, when I get to his rebuttal to me. So uh, regarding Deuteronomy 6 and 4, it reads Yahweh Elohim Yahweh Echad. What's fascinating is that Yahweh is ontologically Elohim, seeing as Yahweh is ontologically God. There is a sense in which God's ontology is multiple in its existence, yet he's also one. Again, if only there were a viewpoint in which God's ontology was both singular and multiple. If only. Uh, moreover, the uh, the um the Apostle Paul elucidates more information regarding the Shema, because in 1 Corinthians 8 and 6, he, he tells us that there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and he actually expands the Shema. He says, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. Now, I'm not going to make a whole argument about uh, 1 Corinthians 8 and 6, because my opponent did very good to stick with the topics at hand, but I had to mention that in passing. But uh, notice the constant distinctions that are being made. That is very important to note. So that's as far as I'll go with that. Uh, to address Isaiah 64 and verses 8 through 9, uh, again, this is the very fallacy of equivocation I warned of in my opening statement. There is no evidence that Father here refers to the person of the Father. God is our Father in terms of being the Creator. Let's say I were to point that Isaac in Romans 9 is our Father. If I use my opponent's logic, I could say I could claim that Paul is saying Isaac is the person of the Father and the Godhead. Uh, again, it's just Jesus' father creation and the father father creation. Therefore, Jesus is the person of the father. It's fallacious to its core. Similarly, he made an argument in Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, uh, for us uh, for us being his son, therefore God is the father. And I, would, I won't spend much time on that. It's just more equivocation. But what I found interesting in his opening statement, my opponent used the King James for most of his arguments, but for some odd reason, when quoting Galatians 3.20, he did so in the now dated Amplified Translation of 1987. He says it points out that God is one person only. This is obviously a mistake, considering that prosopon and hypo, or nor hypostasis are used here, and the committee for the Amplified Version, likewise re, they likewise realized their mistake and changed it in the 2015 revision. My opponent used the King James for all of his texts, but for this particular text, he used the Amp Classic. Quite ironic, since this, as flawed as the King James can be at times, th it got this portion correct. Um, but I, I'm i not sure if I remember if he addressed Acts 20-28. I, I believe that uh, I believe that he did because this is what was submitted when we told each other the verses we would use. So I'm, I'm still going to address this, but I don't quite uh, remember if he addressed this. So um, again, God purchasing the church with his own blood makes perfect sense because the son is a distinct person from the father. And by the way, you could scratch this if you didn't mention it because we, we did have an agree uh, in agreement on that. So uh, the 
God purchasing the church with his own blood makes perfect sense because the son is a distinct per a divine person from the father as shown here. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8. Well, I'm not going to get into that because I'm going to get into that in a little bit. So now I want to I want to address the things that were said in his uh, rebuttal statement. So my opponent emphasized that the son has spoken to us by his son now in Hebrews chapter 1. But he completely ignored the fact that the son created the ages and he also did not address that the son is the exact imprint of the father's hypostasis. If the son is the exact imprint of the father's substance, that would have to make the son's substance eternal if the father is also eternal in his substance. Um, does, and then uh, he asked, does God have to be appointed to something? Uh, the answer is yes, because according to Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 5 through 8, hold on, no, no, I need this. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, I read this in my opening, but it's relevant again. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, yeah, right here. Uh, it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, although he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born the likeness of men. I'm about to address another one of my opponent's points. After and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, so for those aforementioned reasons, God has highly exalted him. That's what the proof is right there. The proof is that Jesus emptied himself, and my opponent brought this up. Was Jesus no longer divine when he came down to earth? No, not at all. He was actually, and I'm saying no, not at all to what he, yes. Jesus is in fact God, but... Remember, he emptied himself not by losing something, but by taking on something when he took on human flesh. That is the way in which he emptied himself. He is, he's fully God and fully man. That is the hypostatic union. And regarding God having a God, that's, I mean, that, that doesn't really, uh, there's no problem here. It's just saying, well, I don't like it. It sounds weird. Well, you're not allowing the Trinitarian view to possibly be true. It does say, in fact, in Hebrews 1, that Jesus is, that Yahweh is calling Jesus God. But Yahweh the Father is calling the Son God, and he called him Yahweh as well. In Kurios, because that's quoting Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27, that is that is a Yahweh passage, and he applied the Elohim passage. So if he called him Yahweh and Elohim and said, God, you're God, yes, we have to accept that. God has a God. There's still only one God, but... This is how it is. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This, And he was right to point out that this is more reflective of the economic trinity. So I don't even know why he bothered to make that point, knowing that fact. It doesn't, it doesn't really get us anywhere. Um, and to get anything more of a rebuttal, I mean, I think that was... Uh, how much time do I have? Free. Okay, perfect. So I want to bring this up. So if when this is correct about the Son, then about what he's saying about the son, that the son is a creature, because he doubled down on this in Hebrews 1. If oneness is correct about the son, then likewise God in eternity past was not the father, since there was no other whom he could relate a fatherly relationship with. Consequently, denial of eternal sonship negates eternal fatherhood. And if God is not eternally, if he has not eternally been the father, then from eternity past there was no Godhead. It's a creation. That's the devastation of the oneness view. That's one of the many forms of it. Uh, so to so the folks who have been taken in by the ancient heresy of Sibelius, you may want to consider these things because the, this, these are the problems that you're presented with. I really think that's, that's all I need in terms of rebuttal. I'll leave it at that. Okay, and that is with about three minutes to spare. Now we'll be moving on to our two times ten minute cross-examinations each. So we will start with Brandon. You can question Isaiah and let me know when you would like me to start your 10 minutes of cross-examination. All right. Can you hear me again? Yep, we hear you. Good. Okay. And again, I uh, think it's going good so far. Well, Isaiah, I'm going to start with the book of Hebrews. Uh, and I'm going to start here in uh, verse 8. Well, better yet, I will go to verse two. Uh, when the Bible says, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, what is your, do you believe that this means that this time is unique because he has spoken to us by his son? Yes, it is. That wasn't the point I was making from Hebrews one, that he didn't speak to us in his revealed son at that time. 
No, I was just asking to make sure I'm having the right understanding before I proceed with uh, my other questions. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So look, I'll just uh, I'll clarify that answer. So yes, he was speaking in these last days to the sun because the incarnation had happened, but that does not prove that the sun was not speaking in the Old Testament. But when it says in these last days, he's spoken to us by, by his son, he's making a comparison in contrast. And he says in verse one that he spoke to them by the fathers and the prophets. Uh, wouldn't it have been as easy for the writer to say, well, he spoke to us by the son then. Uh, but, you know, now this time uh, he's speaking to us by him again. Do you not believe that him speaking to us through the son or by the son is what makes uh, this particular time or dispensation unique? I would say that's fine because uh, when what's actually gone on to say after that is that the son is the one who created the ages. He's the means by which he created the ages and he's the exact imprint of the father's hypostasis. So what we have to infer by that is that this is in the more profound sense in which the son has been revealed. In the Old Testament, the son was not revealed in the profound sense that it was post-incarnation. So that's what would be the, well, the circumstances and, and described. And I appreciate that clarity, but I, I would say I wasn't uh, referring to the revelation of who he was, but far as him speaking in the Old Testament, uh, that in verse two, it makes it very clear that in my estimation that this is what makes this uh, dispensation as far as when it says by whom also he made the worlds. Uh, in the Old Testament, we have God as the single of the father is the one crafting everything personally. Would you still say that if the son created it, that God is the one who is a, who was the one forming and making all things? The father, I mean, I'm sorry. Yes, because all things are made from the father, but through whom the means by which everything was made was through the son. That has to necessitate eternal sonship. So the only way that this could be understood is that this is a more profound sense in which the son has spoken to us because the son did in fact speak in the old testament because we saw jesus spoke in the old testament okay i will go further uh into my understanding verse three when it says he being the brightness uh of his glory and the express image of his person and you were right to mention hypostasis or hypostasis i'm sorry for my southern draw there uh the hypostasis of course being another way of saying of his person do you believe the image of the person that's mentioned there is the person of the father the exact imprint of the father's hypostasis, yes, that is correct. But because he's the exact imprint, that's, that has to be a distinction. And I do hold to the doctrine of eternal generation. The son has eternally proceeded from the father. So it would have to be the case that just by virtue of being the imprint, the father's not the imprint of anything, of anything of, aside from himself. So, yeah, the son is the exact imprint of the father's hypostasis, the same way he's the image of the invisible God as well. So he is the exact imprint. Uh, would you agree that this, and what's my time, Alexander? I'm sorry. Your time is six. Good stuff. He is the, the exact imprint. Do you think that he is making a difference here between uh, what what would, could the father be imprinting himself in? Because it's in verse two, it says in these last days, making it seem almost as that uh, better yet, this is a time period that we're talking about, that he being the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person. Who do you believe that they're referring to as the uh, expressed image of his person? The express um, you mean who he's the exact imprint of or yeah like who who is the who is the 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 who is expressing the image or better yet who is the expressed image in verse three the expressed image would be jesus the son be jesus yes and would you agree that that jesus is the son yes and do you believe that it was in and i'm not trying to jump scriptures in galatians four and four that in the fullness of time god sent his son made of a woman uh, yeah, in terms of his incarnation, but we see the preexistence of the son if you just keep on reading in Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, okay. We'll, we'll go there a little bit further. And uh, let's see, let's uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. verse 8, when he says, but until the son, he saith. And what particular psalm, again, I, I want to make sure I didn't mishear you, that you believe that this was quoting? I'm sorry, which part did you just refer to? In Hebrews 1 and 8. He was one. He's quoting Psalm forty-five. Forty-five. Who is the speaker in uh, Psalm forty-five? According to the author of Hebrews, the father is. The father is the speaker of Psalms forty-five. If you read from Hebrews chapter one, verse five, yes, he is speaking through the psalmist, but it is the father speaking. Why in verse? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to say, according to Hebrews verse 1 through 5, he continues to attribute the Father saying these expressions. So I trust the author of Hebrews knows how to exegete the text. And I, I do the same. Why is it, I believe, starting with verses six through seven and especially verses eight, that it starts, uh, that it switches from the person? Whereas I believe in uh, verses one through five, we have it in first person, but in verses uh, starting with six, especially through eight, it, it switches to the third person. Uh, because they're different songs. The, so if it's the same person speaking, why should the, uh, the person change if it's the same one speaking? Well, it doesn't matter because you can see in Zechariah, you have the Lord, he refers to himself in the third person and switches to the first person. He says, I am the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God is one. So even the Shema, which you, which you were referring to in Deuteronomy 6, 4, that's him switching between first and third person. Uh, I don't know the word, but it slips me now, but first and third person perspective. So you're saying that it doesn't matter. I would I would find that very suspicious seeing that uh, the writer uh, in that passage is not described as the father that's speaking uh, and especially seeing the context of the song being an enthronement song. But I do appreciate your answer because of my time. Let's turn to Revelation uh, six. Oh, well, may, may I rebut that last point? Uh, sure. Alexander, what's the time? Just to make sure. You have three minutes. Never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go to the next round. Gonna... Yeah, and, and I'm sorry. My ADD is kicking in. Uh, oh, cool. Revelation 5, and I, and this is actually one of my most favorite passages out of the book of Revelation. We know from Revelation 4 that he's uh, the scripture tells us quite clearly that uh, John, he was taken in the spirit, and he sees one on the throne, uh, and they call him Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and which is to come. And this passage of Psalms that deals with the right hand of God, which I know you're very astute in. In Revelation uh, 5 and 5, it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Why do you believe that he's being called lion when later on uh, we see him being described in more detail as a lamb? Uh, well, I have to say that Revelation is taking place in the spiritual plane. So a lot of... Uh odd scenery is occurring to convey different ideas. So it's the same way that you would see a son of man at the same time that you also see a lamb, you'll see a lion. So as far as why that is, I'd say because in different contexts, they're conveying different ideas. But we can't agree that that is Jesus speaking or Bill. I'm sorry, not speaking, being described. Gotcha. I definitely agree. And, and looking at this description, why do you think he has seven eyes and seven horns? Because I don't remember in the Gospels him having seven horns. Why do you think these these characteristics are given to him? Uh, well, that's a more of an eschatology discussion. I will be the first to admit that's not really my field. But uh, from my understanding, it would be representative of seven churches or even seven spirits that go about with them. That's to my very limited understanding. I, I'm more of just exegeting expository. Right. Well, from looking at the book, uh, horns is definitely representation of power, seven being the fullness of power. And my understanding, eyes being the, the uh, vision, fullness of vision, which means uh, omnipresence or being able to see all things. In, in this instance, right, the Bible says uh, earlier that the lamb came from the midst of the throne. Why do you think he came from the midst of the throne? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really know where you're going with this. Uh, if you have a point that you're making, please uh, elucidate because I'm more. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, w when it says here that he's coming from the midst of the throne, the word, uh, and I can't remember the Greek word exactly off of my head, it means the middle of the throne, which means the place of divine power. Uh, and it puts it in the right hand of the Lamb. So you believe in particular that when it says that the invisible God, uh, has a hand, in particular a right hand, that this means literally that he's putting it in the right hand of a literal lamb in heaven? No, I would just say in proximity. To the right would you think, do you think that it's uh, possible that the slain lamb, which I, I wonder about a lamb that's walking around that's already slain, that this could be representation that the true lamb or the true human nature is uh, proceeding or better yet is uh, subject to the divine nature that uh, sits in him as the father in his flesh. And Not as that, the father. that is time. Uh, so, Isaiah, so if you'd like to respond that. to that last point. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so um, no, not as the father, because he is distinguished as the son, because there's the ancient of days and the son of man sitting at his side. Now, that's not to say the son of man is not also the ancient of days, because the ancient of days is describing God. But he is the set aside one in that in that type of way. 
Uh, no, I don't see any way in which you would have to conclude that that's the father. I, I would say there's a lot that, to the contrary. But um, I'll I'll leave it at that. So you ready? Okay. Yeah, uh, Isaiah, let me know when you'd like me to start your ten minute cross examination period. Well, let's start right now. So, uh, so Brandon, is the son divine? He is divine in the sense that he is inhabited by the uh, divine spirit of the father, in my understanding. Okay. Was he divine on this earth? He was uh, divine in, as, as a part of the incarnation, yes. Okay, so if he, if he was divine during that, how could he be interacting with the divine nature when he was in fact divine during the incarnation, as you said? Because he took on a true human identity, which is not just composite of uh, the outer exterior of his body, but he had a true human soul, uh, which would enclose his mind, his thoughts, his feelings and emotions, uh, thus making him our kinsman redeemer. Uh, he had to be just like us in his humanity, which would have limited mind if, if I'm answering that uh, the way you want to. Uh, OK, so if it is the case that he took that on, he if this is just inward and outward. How is there room for him to be divine at all? Well, because uh, the true spirit of the father uh, dwelled within him. And because it's the spirit that was within him, not in the sense of uh, as he dwells within us uh, in the new birth, but in the sense of that, it says that it was the father in Christ. And more importantly, he was the one doing the works and speaking uh, as far as the mechanics of the metaphysical mystery. I would easily say that's above my pay grade. But so he. Uh, Oh, sorry. But but in my understanding of the scripture, he makes it quite clear that it is the father within him. And we know that this is the true God. So I have this question. So why, when he's interacting with his divine nature, he's always looking up to the heavens, always looking up away from himself. If the divine nature is truly indwelled into him, why does why is that needed? If the immediate presence of the father is inside of the son nature. Just just to be clear for clarity, are you talking about a particular instance in scripture? Uh, for example, like in uh, John chapter 17, when he looks up to the heavens and said, Father, glorify me. Yes. Oh, I love that passage, uh, because I think if anything shows the duality of the man, Christ Jesus, I think 17, uh, St. John 17 does it uh, in his high priestly prayers when he explicitly makes it clear that the father is the true God. Now, as to why, as a man, when he pray in this way, maybe it's because of his uh, nature as a man being a Jewish man of how he prays that I could not answer. But as a true and legitimate man, he had to pray in Hebrews makes it clear that he prayed in the days of his flesh so what about in matthew 3 when we see the that uh, the spirit descending like a dove and the voice from heaven if that's supposedly the divine nature isn't that supposed to be inside of him why, why is it in heaven good question i would say that the baptism of christ shows as a uh, wonderful representation of what happened let me because I actually have some notes on this I wanted to go over. Uh, when we look at the baptism of Christ, the first thing we have to understand is that the Lord or the true God is omnipresent. He is omni-localized. First thing we have to ask ourselves, in my opinion, uh, what was the purpose of his baptism? Uh, in mine, it was to fulfill all righteousness. And he was baptized, according to uh, John 1, 26 through 27, uh, to make himself known to Israel. And also, it was also there to help John John the Baptist, uh, because it was confirmed uh, to him in First John uh, 32 and 34, that the one that he sees the spirit descending upon, that this is going to be the Messiah. It was for John to be uh, identifying also the dove descending on him was a sign to show that he was the anointed uh, one that was going to fulfill the role uh, to bring salvation to mankind. So, OK, so omnipresence would be the answer. So that brings me to the next question. So. In John 14, 28, you know where, where Jesus says, uh, if you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So in Hebrews 9, 20, uh, 24, likewise corroborates that Jesus had to go into the Father's presence. So I understand you would see this along the lines of the human nature speaking to the divine, right? But if it is the case that the Father is the one taking on the flesh, how can he ever be somewhere that the Father is not immediately present? Well, I think this is a good uh, sense when Jesus is speaking of going to the Father in this instance. I believe that he is speaking of going to heaven to be on the throne. And again, uh, because the Father is omnipresent, there is not a place that he cannot go. 
but he is going away bodily. I believe this is a statement of speaking in his humanity. So, so I'm, I'm a little confused. So you, him going to the father is to go to the throne. The, the father means the throne here. I would say that, of course, this means this is where he's seated in the heavenlies. Uh, I would say this is definitely what this is referring to because the father is within him. And, uh, of course, the father is omnilocal. So, OK, how could the father ever be greater than him then? Because the, the father. I'm sorry, because the eternal spirit is greater than the humanity. As a real man, he had to have the same limitations as being a man. Of course, like Hebrew says, that can pray, that had limitations. He wasn't in all places at once. I believe that is how the father is greater because he doesn't so have just, the limitations he, of humanity. Okay, so he's all places at once. So the father being in the son that makes the, fa the son the father is what you're saying? I'm saying that within the son, it was the father incarnate in the son, revealing himself and reconciling the world into himself. But I'm saying God, because he is omnipresent, that him being incarnate in the son doesn't limit him from being other places at the same time. OK, so it, so since the uh, since the father is indwelling in the son and that makes him God, the father also is said to dwell in us. Does that make us God? I would say, and again, when we say dwell, it's with the understanding that he is incarnate into uh, the father. He is the direct impression or the direct imprint of the father's person, whereas the father does indwell us by being the promise of the comforter of the spirit coming back within us, that his indwelling presence and his incarnate presence is two different things in my understanding. OK, how much time do I have? You have. Okay, perfect. So um, that brings me to this question then. So Hebrews 1 says that God created the Ionios through the Son. How then could you possibly maintain the position that the Son is himself a creature, though? He created the Ion. Uh, and again, your Greek pronunciation is better than mine. He created the ages in the Son in the incarnation. I believe this is referring to the ages that are to come that we will enjoy in Christ Jesus. Uh, I wouldn't say that because way, later when you look at verses 8 through 10, you see that they, he laid the foundation in the beginning. So this is not the new age. This is the, the original creation. Let me, I'm turning to the description. What verse did you just quote there? That, that was from uh, verses 8 through 10. You can see that he laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. Well, I think this is still building on your assumption that this is a son talking, especially seeing he saith is not in the original well, Greek. But well, no, um, not, to, not, no, I'm not saying the son's talking. I'm saying the father is. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the father. Uh, I think that's still building on your assumption that this is the father talking to the son. When my contention is, is that looking at the context of Psalms 45 and seeing the change from first and third person, I have no reason to believe that this is the same speaker from verses one through five. OK, so let's let's read from verse five. So let's see when does the speaker change. So it says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. And again, he brings the firstborn into the world. He says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers flame of fire, a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says. So where did the speaker change? Where did it stop? In, 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 in verse, uh, I believe here in verse seven or six, uh, and I don't have the exact uh, Greek word with me there, but I believe if you go back and parse it, you will clearly see that it changed to third person. Which, again, we have to accept your assumption that God never speaks of himself in the third person. Even the Shema proves that he did speak in the third person. Oh, you! I can respond? Yeah, so I'm a bit lost because especially verse 7, the previous verse says, of the angels, he says. So who's he in verse 7? And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angel spirits and his uh, ministers a flame of fire. Who's speaking there? Let me see here. I would have to say this is uh, at this verse, this is the father. I have to say this is probably still the so, father. So where did the speaker change between that and verse eight? I, I would say I, correction. I would say verse eight would definitely be the change. But you have to assert that to hold your position, don't you? 
No, I don't have to uh, assert it. Uh, I believe this is clearly seen through the text and it being a direct quotation from Psalms 45. How do you figure that this can't be the father speaking? Because it wasn't the one speaking in Psalms 45. I mean, the oh. father speaking in Psalms 45. But it was the psalmist in all of those other psalms. He, these were different psalms. I'm sorry. Because all of those were God speaking, but for some reason at Psalm 45, you say this isn't God speaking now. Yeah, because and, it was. Uh, that, that is time. Uh, Brandon, okay. if you would like to give a last response to that, you can. Sure, sure. And uh, what's my time on that? Uh, oh, that that that's the end of Isaiah's time. If, if you want to start uh, your next 10-minute oh. rebuttal, you can. We have uh, two ten saying, minute rebuttals. Yeah, yeah, we are. We're doing two ten minute rebuttals each. Not not rebuttals, okay. sorry. Um cross examinations. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, let me pull my notes. Yeah, so if you'd like to start your ten minute cross examination, let me know. Gotcha. <laughs> let's uh we'll come back to Hebrews. Let's 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 go back to uh let's see here, Revelation uh the fifth chapter. Or better yet, and and I know this wasn't on the exact uh the exact text you quoted, but I did hear you make a side quote to uh, Daniel 7 uh, when you referred to the Ancient of Days. Would it be okay for me to cross-reference that, Xavier? I don't want to breach our... Uh, yeah, that's fine. I did bring it up. Yeah. Uh, in Daniel the 7th chapter, when we see the Ancient of Days being mentioned there, are you proposing uh, that the one that's coming to him in the clouds is different? Revelation uh, 7 or Daniel 7? Daniel 7. Uh, so can you say that again, please? Are you saying that the one coming to him in the clouds is uh, Jesus Christ? In, in that the, son, the, the son of man who comes with the clouds of heaven, that would be Jesus. But you, that is not to say that Jesus is not also in the principle of sharing as the Ancient of Days, because I do believe Jesus is God alongside the Father. Gotcha. And when, when you see the description of the Ancient of Days there, would you agree that that description visibly puts you in mind of uh, Jesus Christ from Revelation 1? Of the Son of Man? Uh, sure. Sure. Gotcha. Okay. And my, my next question would be to that, seeing that this is the case in that within Daniel 7, we have an interpretation from the angel himself uh, that is there when he had tried to get meaning. Why doesn't the, uh, the, the angel interpret this to be a second divine being? I don't believe in two divine beings. I believe in, two I mean, a second persons. divine person. I'm sorry. Uh, because there's still only one God. So yeah, I would agree. Well, we're like, what, 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 what part, what part are you referring to specifically? So I can know what you're talking about. And I'm still turning here. Had to change my setup. Uh, let's see. Daniel seven. Uh, let me see the interpretation. Uh, let's say at verse sixteen, I came near to one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of this, so that he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the kings. Uh, these great beasts which you saw, we see that they are representing kingdoms. Uh, within this interpretation, uh, the one that comes in twenty two to the uh, ancient of days, why does it then describe uh, that person as coming to him as the saints of the most high? It says until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the most high. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? And the time well, came when the saints possessed the king. I don't, I don't understand how you're getting. Well, that. in the first part of the vision, we see that it is the one coming to him in the clouds that's possessing the kingdom. But in verse 22, we have the saints being the one that's coming and possessing the kingdom. Do you believe then that this is still referring to a uh, pre-incarnate Christ and not figurative uh, say, for the saints of God? I would say that's again equivocation just because they, the ancient of days came and the saints came. That doesn't make the saints the ancient of days. That's, that's equivocation. No, I didn't say the ancient of days. I said the one like the son of uh, the one coming in clouds like the son of man. Oh, even that. So uh, saints rule with Christ under Christ, though. So he says, to, uh, even in Revelation 3, he says the very thing. Um, he says it right here in uh, verse 19 of, of uh, Revelation 3. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. And mm -hmm. I, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. 
Gotcha. Let's look at verses 13 through 14. It says, I saw in the night visions, but hell, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. Oh, wait, where in, did you say where? I'm sorry. Daniel 7 verses 13 through 14. Okay. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that we shall not be destroyed. But we have here in the interpretation uh, that the saints of the most high shall possess the kingdom, possessing the kingdom forever and forever and ever. I'm just trying to see where do we see a singular person in the interpretation being one that comes and receives the kingdom here. No, because again, I, I just answered that. It shows that the saints are coming to rule with Christ. So, so I don't, I don't really see what, I'm sorry. I, I don't really see what's the point that you're getting at because what's well, the case that the, oh, I'm sorry, Glenn. Would it not be since we understand that the only image that we see here are the saints re receiving it in verses 13 through 14, wouldn't it not also mean that the son of man that's coming in the clouds here must be the equivalent of the saints receiving the kingdom? No, we shouldn't say that that's the equivalent. Wait, when you say equivalent, in the, in the mean I mean the equivalence in the interpretation. The equivalence in interpretation? Uh, no, you're just kind of saying, well, why doesn't it specifically say that this is a two persons God? That's, that's more of an argument from silence and assuming God can't be multipersonal. Well, wouldn't it also be an assumption from silence if we're saying that this must be the uh, Jesus Christ pre-incarnate in this sense, uh, if it doesn't clearly say that also? Yeah, but he also said in John three thirteen that the Son of Man descended from heaven, and he distinguishes himself, and he even said he wants to sit with his father. Gotcha. I understand it, and and I believe in my understanding that this is in reference to his divine nature. But and it relates to Daniel seven. I guess I'm just trying to see because this is used as a reference to show a uh, eternally existent son. And looking into the text, I don't quite see it. But let okay, me what about when Jesus was on trial? Um, well, I don't mean to point this in a question, but Jesus on trial, and he well, said, "You will see the man, the Son of Man, coming with the sons of, with the clouds of heaven." And they they said, "He's uttered blasphemy." Praise the Lord, and that's really good because the only problem I would have with that is that in Daniel seven, he's going to the Ancient of Days, uh, and he's not coming to the earth. So we got a motion uh, contradiction there. Why is in this instance he's going to the Ancient of Days, but in that instance you quoted he's coming to the earth? I'm sorry, can you repeat that last part? I, I'm sorry, I know <laughs> I said a lot there. Uh, in Daniel seven, the one like the Son of Man is going to the Ancient of Days, right? But we know that when Jesus comes, he comes in the clouds. He's coming to the earth. And I know we're both both post tribulationists. So we both believe he's coming uh, at the end of the tribulation. He's coming to the earth to establish uh, the millennial reign. Why do we have emotion conflicts when we're looking at these instances? Uh, because the father is going to be the one to give him the kingdom there. So that does have an order. But how? Oh, I, oh. Oh, well. No, I'm sorry, but I guess I'm just saying, but then how could he be the one coming in this instance? It it, it seems like these may not be parallel events. And I don't see how that necessarily follows. I, I'm kind of lost on what your reasoning is here. Okay. I, 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 that, that may be that may be my problem. So. No, by, by no means, no means. And I, I appreciate Alexander. What where am I on time before I go to the next one? You have two minutes. Good, good stuff. Okay. When we see the uh, baptism of Jesus Christ, Isaiah, and we see that the one who's uh, in these instances, would you say that, uh, I guess in my instance, when you see the Holy Ghost uh, descending in the form of a dove, do you believe the Holy Ghost just took on the form of a dove or he always exists as a dove? Or what, what do you believe is happening there? Well, it just says he came down as a dove, so I'm not saying he's necessarily as a bird. It could just be the fashion in which it happened. I don't know what that would look like. Got but you. The point is, I do know that that's distinct from the voice in heaven and uh, and the one emerging out the water. Well, and, and this is a good point on the day of Pentecost, because it definitely here he uses, uh, in the instance you gave, sensory images to... How can you say represent uh, things that he's trying to happen on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost descended? We have uh, the manifestation of sound. We have the manifestation of uh, what they can see, tongues of, you know, uh, fire. And uh, the, of course, what they're experiencing experientially. Do, do you think that it was uh, maybe multiple Holy Ghosts that they were having in Acts 2 since various things were happening at once? 
multiple holy i don't believe there's more than one holy spirit if we're talking about but, that but you believe it was one spirit in acts 2 one spirit who was coming down so yeah the holy spirit the comforter but he was but how could he be doing that at the same time uh making the wind you know the, the sound of a mighty rushing wind then he, they appeared to them uh cloven tongues of fire you got all these things happening at once uh how would because you from God. the trinity he's got well i guess my question would be well since we see this multiple or multi-sensory manifestation in acts two why can't one spirit be doing that in matthew three because it shows the distinction between them because it's ha you have the sun the son being proclaimed by the father while the holy spirit is descending there's no reason to think that these are multi-personal i mean sorry no reason to think this is i a agree single person. No, no, <laughs> i know i know <laughs> a single person there's no reason to think he's a single person because that would be deceptive to those around him because he's give, he's saying this is my son with whom i'm well pleased if he was saying your position he would just say this is my human nature that i'm going to come down onto and be in and i'm also there right now in whom i'm well pleased in myself and that is time. Uh, Isaiah, let me know when you'd like me to start your 10 minutes. Okay, so I want to return to the book of Hebrews. So um, this is only going to be brief because I have other questions I want to get to. So uh, wh why does, uh, again, what what is your basis for rejecting that the Father speaking in verse 8? What Because we were about to get to that and then we lost time. So uh, definitely. My understanding as the reason why we understand uh, that this is not false, because in the exact psalm here, as I said earlier, is a, a direct quotation from Psalms 45, verse 6 through 7. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, except of righteousness, is except of his kingdom, which you definitely quoted. Uh, what I would see there, especially seeing the tense of, of the person speaking, I see a switch there, and it appears to me that another person is talking. Uh, okay, so how are you doing that without being circular? Because you, you granted all the other ones before, especially the previous verse, is in fact God talking. So why are you assuming for this one that God is not talking? I'm well, not for the other that. verses, uh, just going off the top of my head here, as far as my memory of them, looking at these other verses, we see that this is, in it is quoting directly the Father speaking. My issue with Psalms 45, that this is not the Father speaking. In those other verses, I would accept these to be prophetic, uh, how can you say, utterances of, of the one Spirit of God speaking. But in Psalm 45, I have no indication that this is God, the God is the speaker here. How about the fact that the, the person speaking never changed? I would disagree with that by the sense of, uh, and again, I don't have my note on it, but I can definitely get it to you. But there is a clear switch uh, from first to third person. No, 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 no. I don't mean like the the mode in which it was being spe uh, spoken, like first to third person. I mean the person who's doing the speaking, because you already you you cited the Shema, which does show first and third person usage in the same context. So why is that not allowed here? Why why can it not be the case that God refers himself both or to another in both first and third person? Why is it not? And again, not to seem, uh, so it may be again, as if you said earlier, I, uh, this isn't on your part, maybe it's my understanding of your question, but I would still say uh, that that and from the fact that Psalm 45 is a direct quotation uh, that we don't have uh, the father being the one that's speaking here. I don't have a, a reason to believe that the father is speaking in verse eight. Okay. And what? so last thing about this, why did the author of Hebrews not say the psalmist said this? Why didn't he say the father said this? He did, and that's what I'm showing you. It, but I'm not. I'd say you're being arbitrary. Not, no, well, I mean, and, and, I, and I respect your opinion of that. But in verse eight, uh, of, of course, as you know, it he saith is not there. Uh, and then, yeah. of course, with the verses being added later on at another point in time, uh, within these verses, it cuts off the direct quote that he has uh, from the Psalms that is quoting. So I think it's a little bit more. Uh, involved in just to base it on that part okay so we, we could just move on to the next point so in my opening statement i quoted first john 2 24 and it says that we should abide in the sun why on earth should we be abiding spiritually in a created man remind you not the words this alleged creature speaks but the creature himself why should we and let me call that you said first john 2 24 because it has the father and the son to dwell in both why should we be dwelling? In, why should we, I'm sorry, abiding? Why should we abide in a creature? 
Well, I'll begin. I would say that when he's speaking of Jesus Christ, we're speaking of the full incarnate God man that's resident within him. Uh, when we to bite into Jesus, uh, that Jesus sometimes can speak in different parts. And in first John five, no, two twenty four. Yes, sir. But I was fixing to use another verse here. Oh, and okay, sorry, no. Uh, you, you good. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know him. That is true. And we are in him. That is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. So to know the son is to know the father. OK, but why are we abiding in the son? Not just knowing the son. Why are we abiding in a creature? If if Because from our perspective, it makes sense. The son is the second divine person. Why from your perspective? Because you believe the father is the divine nature. But the son is not divine in himself. He's a human, a human creation. Why should we abide in a creature? No, that is the assertion you make about my position that he is just oh, a. a... And I'm saying, please correct me. That's what I was to say. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and again, I ain't trying to be snappy, but uh, in it, what I understand is that, again, I believe this goes more towards the metaphysical mystery of how this could take place, that when we see the incarnation, we see a work that has never been done. And because of this, there are some things that are taking place that are different. So I, in my understanding, will accept Jesus's testimony of that the father being in him and him being in the father, that the interchangeable uh uh, how can you say location is the same? So when he says this to me, I think it can be interchangeable depending on the context. Okay. And do you see how somebody could read this and conclude that God is multi-personal? Of course, being a Trinity, a former Trinitarian myself, I definitely understand how uh, an intelligent person could come to that conclusion, but I would disagree with them based on the whole council of scripture. Okay. So let me ask you, what would you have to see in scripture besides Jesus saying the exact words, I am not the father to accept that Jesus is not the person of the father? Well, uh, I'm not sure how to approach it from a negative standpoint, because I usually just try to take it on what he said. But to be honest, I'm not sure if I have an answer for you on that, Isaiah. OK, fair enough. So my next question in John chapter five, Jesus said that the father judges nobody himself, but has left all judgment to him. But how is this not a lie if you're saying Jesus is the father? I believe that this is going to be the judgment that's going to take place through the incarnation. But the father is the one who incarnated. Yes, yes, I believe this is I believe in this instance that this is a direct correlation to the incarnate work of the father in flesh that would judge all things. The Bible says that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, so I see no contradiction in that. Not, that well, the I'm only saying, per oh, I, I that him say, the fa the father being the one in that flesh and he's doing that if it's the father doing it then if the father's doing that then you, you don't see the problem there he said he's not going to do it but at the same time he is doing it yes and i believe that he's going to judge all things through the work of jesus christ so the father is okay and jesus you're talking about the the created man or the divine jesus well, when you say divine Jesus, what do you mean? I mean, his divine nature or his created human nature? I, well, I believe his divine nature is the same as the father. So when the judgment is taking place and I believe the incarnation makes them one ontological being, I believe it's one and the same in that instance. Wait, I, I thought the father is his divine nature, though. Yes, the father is the divine nature. It is God within him. But I said it's one ontological being and to be a human, of course, would separate the two natures. So, so then you would have to be saying the father is carrying out this judgment because that's inevitable. You're saying we're being judged by the divine. But according to what your understanding of father and son is, it can't be the divine. The divine can't be the one doing this because the father's not judging anyone. Well, I believe, of course, that this is the father and the son that will be committing the judgment. And again, I think that I'm sorry. I, oh, you're fine. And again, and again, in this, I think this hints more towards the metaphysical mystery of the incarnation. So, OK, so I'll leave that one at that. Um, so my next question. Uh, so in Matthew 20, uh, why did Jesus act as if he is not the father to the believing mother of the sons of Zebedee? Why, why did he? Why did he make it appear as if this is something he can't do? He can't be capable of or why didn't he even just say flat out no to her? Well, I would have to say we would definitely have to uh, 
stick with what the Lord said. I couldn't tell you it has his reasoning, but I could tell you that based on his composition and even according to the Council of Constantinople, uh, that one person can have two minds uh, within the hypostatic union. Uh, I believe that in instances Jesus spoke from his human consciousness and in other instances he spoke from his divine uh, consciousness. And in this instance, uh, in his human consciousness, he made it clear uh, that he would uh, not, that it'd be the father that would be appointing. Okay, so why did it say to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. You, you don't see how some, how especially she would look at this as, okay, well, you're not the father. You don't see how she would understand it that way. I can understand how it could be uh, confusing, just like uh, with Philip, it could be confusing. Uh, but I think it's a little bit more involved than probably simplistically what we're making it. Okay, so uh, how much time do I have, Alexander? You have. Oh. Okay, so this is my final question. So the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 cites Jesus' humility and obedience to his father as an example of humility and obedience for us, as, uh, as we do for the one above us. How is this message not completely tarnished by the position that Jesus is his own father and is not submitting to another divine person? How do you maintain that spirit of humility and obedience? Good question. I would say definitely let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I believe just as uh, Constantinople would say in that instance, uh, that this would be an example of the human mind that we are, are expected to emulate. Uh, that is a humble that submits to the divine spirit or else if this was uh, even if this was the second person of the Trinity, this would still if from your understanding, I'm using Trinitarian language, this would be beyond the scope of our ability to fully uh, emulate because it would still be God. So definitely we're doing something that was within our ability, which would be the example that we see in the man, Christ Jesus. I don't think I have anything more for that. I can't say anything. Okay. Well, that is the end of the cross-examination periods. Now we will begin our 20-minute audience Q&A. Uh, so we will allow people to raise their hands uh, Open to everyone so anyone that does want to ask a question, please do raise your hand We will invite you up and please do keep your questions both on topic and Also keep your questions under a minute. Otherwise, I will have to stop you Okay, let me invite a few people up and I will get you to speak in the order that you come up in. Okay, we'll, we'll keep it to that for now, and then once the speakers on stage have asked their questions, they can let me set the timer for 20 minutes. Okay, uh, Dehuan, I think you were the first person to get up on stage, so you can ask your question. Cool, thank you. And uh, I'll just say great job on the debate to both speakers, to the moderation, been pretty good, uh, fair. And uh, Elder Brandon, you did a wonderful job tonight. But uh, my question is to Isaiah, uh, did the father come in the flesh? No. Mm. I can expand on that. No, the second person of the Trinity, the son, who I've proven in Hebrews 1, has eternally existed alongside the father. Uh, he has come down and he is the image of the invisible God. So because he is the image of the invisible God, and he's also the one who exegetes the invisible God, who no one has seen according to John chapter 1, verse 18, that is who incarnated into the flesh. So when we see him, we see the Father, that's because he's the the icon of Okay, Bobby, well, Brent, Brent, uh, would Brent, you Brent like to ask? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh do you believe, I, of course, I would disagree that Jesus making it very clear that the one that's within him is the father that's doing the work. So my position would be, especially by Jesus being the direct imprint of his divine person, I see no other way but it being the father within. Okay, uh, Bobby, would you like to ask? Yeah, so I need to start with one just so I know whether my question is even relevant to Brandon. So Brandon... Uh, do you believe that uh, John ten thirty teaches that the Jesus that Jesus and the Father are one? Are you quoting that when he says, uh, "Me and my Father are one"? Yeah. Do you believe that that indicates that him and his Father are one? Uh, within this context, yes. Okay. So my question would be: Does this mean one person 
or a unity between persons. So like, for example, does 1 Corinthians 3.8 mean that Paul and Apollos were one person? Does Ephesians 5.31 mean that a husband and wife are one person, etc., that type of stuff? Well, I would definitely say, and thank you for the question, but it's a very good question. I would definitely say when we look at one, we would definitely have to look at the context that the one is being spoken to. But I think this one person is being different because I could say that um, when, like uh, Jesus said, maybe if I try to make the same analogy with my wife, that when you uh, have seen her, you've seen me. Uh, thank God that's not the case because she's much better looking than I am. Uh, but when Jesus made the uh, the statement of oneness within his context that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, I believe, Bubby, this is definitely a different context of oneness. Uh, so uh, I would just say no, because um, John chapter, uh, I believe it's 29. It's saying that him and the Father are one, and he's making himself equal with God. So if he's making himself equal with God, this has to show a distinction in persons. Uh, moreover, in that similarly, that said in John chapter 5, verse 18, he says he claimed God as his own Father making himself equal with God. If that is the case that he has made himself equal with God, that can't make him the same person. He's on par with them. He's equal in his substance. And also we see that he's obedient to him and submissive, and he carries out what he eventually will do, which is to judge the earth, even though the Father judges no one. Okay. Kevin, would you like to ask him? I sure will. I did say uh, congratulations to both of the debaters. I think this was a really good debate. Got a lot of information from this. Um, Isaiah, you did a wonderful job, man. Appreciate the information you brought out. So my question to both of them, I'll start with Brandon on this. Uh, both of them can answer it. Uh, but in uh, John chapter 8, verses uh, 16 through uh, 18, it says this. And yet I do not do judge. My judgment is true, for I am not alone. But I am with the Father who sent me. Is it also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true? I am one that bears witness of myself, and the father who bears witness of me is another. So with that in context, Brandon, what do you think Christ meant by this? And do you think this illustrates me? And, and I'm, I'm turning my nose because I was just having this uh, discussion with someone. I would definitely say that uh, this would have to be examined in this context. Uh, the reason why I'm turning, yeah, the law of witnesses that I've written down because I knew this would probably come up, uh, that when we look at the law of witnesses, I think we have to examine it closely to see what it's being referred to. Uh, because we know in Deuteronomy 19 and 5, uh, we have the example of the works uh, being able to be as a witness. Uh, uh, a witness can be uh, the same person coming in one time. So in this, I don't see how the law of witnesses uh, could be violated looking at this way, because uh, in various instances, we see that it being a multiplicity of witnesses, but it's not always a person. So I think the law of witnesses uh, doesn't always mean uh, has to maintain a multiplicity of persons. Well, in, in that verse, what uh, do you think then it meant by when it says the witness of two men? Because that specifies the type of witness it's talking about. Can you repeat this? It's John chapter 8, verse 17, I mean, 16 through 7 to 18. Thank you. So, so the type of witness there is outlined. It says the witness of two men. So uh, it looks like that facilit that, that kind of uh, truncates the type of witness we're talking about here. No, I wouldn't say necessarily. I think when he quotes it, he's quoting the general uh, law of witness far as where it's written or the way that it's worded that we see in his application that it doesn't always involve two witnesses. And uh, Isaiah, would you like to uh, comment? Yeah, I would say that my opponent's uh, response to that isn't very adequate because it, it would, I would say it's all self-defeating. If it just Why would Jesus even appeal to that if it just doesn't apply to him? Why would he even bring up that point at all? The point is the, the Father and him are different persons. So if they're different persons, then that's why it would apply. It, it would make no sense to even mention that if, if he, was going, he, he was trying to get a, there's special exceptions to this. His whole point is that it is valid and he does fulfill that because he came not to abolish the law, to fulfill it. And that's what he's been doing. Okay, Paul, would you like to ask? Uh, my question is for Isaiah. Um, sure. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. I'm trying to get some clarification on this. Has, because uh, during the uh, debate, everybody seems to be uh, 
Well, uh, well, uh, yeah, Yakov, um, Paul was the next person to uh, ask a question. Okay, so just ask him. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah, Yakov, it's, it's Paul's turn to ask a question as a cue. Uh, Paul, go, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I guess my question so, is to yeah. Uh, 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 wow. <laughs> okay, so my question is for Brandon. As we see, the uh, transfiguration of uh, Christ uh, is in the Synoptic Gospels and uh, also cross-referenced in um, Second Peter. Uh, how would you make up this in your theology when one divine being or entity, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stay away from hypostasis and uh, person for your sake, but uh, one entity is speaking to another entity which direct dialogue and it seemed completely distinct entities how, how would you reconcile that in your theology it, and just to be clear where are you quoting that from you said saint john 10 no no the transfiguration of christ it's uh Matthew john 10 excuse me now if he's talking about the oh, transfiguration that Guys, 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 uh, I go ask it to just stay between uh, Paul and Brandon if Paul's clarified. Okay, thank you. So, again, it is mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels and cross referenced in Second Peter. The references is Matthew 17, 1 to 8, Mark 9, 2 to, 2 to 8, Luke 9, 28 to 36. Uh, the cross references also at Second uh, Peter 1. 16 to 18. And the, the way the early church dealt with it is to refute uh, Sibelius. But uh, I'll let you have a go at it before I respond. And, and I guess you, you kind of gave me a lot of scriptures there. Uh, probably a little bit credit to be faster than what I am. Uh, could you describe the instance? You, well, oh, well, again, uh, I, I kind of needed more clarity on this question. The transfiguration when they he transfigured and it was three it was three. Uh, so hang, hang on, David. All right, I'm, I'm going to respond the best. Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, Paul. Unfortunately, you've gone past the quite a bit past the minute, so I'm just going to let Isaiah respond to. I that, I, that I, I honestly don't really know what to what to make of that myself. So I think we just go to the next one. Well, unfortunately, we'll have to move to the next question then. Uh, B. Ross, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks. And it's just one question, just to be clear, right? Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so this is question is, I guess for both, you can both answer it. Um, could you, because I know, um, Isaiah, you mentioned briefly that you believed in the eternal son. So which kind of gives me an idea of how you may answer the question. So I don't want to assume, and also for Brandon as well, I think I know you're going to answer it. So the question is basically, could you exegete uh, Philippians 2, because Philippians 2 gives some specific language regarding Jesus, and it says he was uh, in the form of God, past tense, um, now it's, he's made in the form of a servant, the likeness of man, he was made in, found in the fashion as a man. So could you exegete what was the form that he was, um, uh, that this uh, Philippians 2 is referring to? Uh, I'll, and I'll any, any, anyone can start that one, yeah. I'll go first, so... Uh, when it says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the more faith than you, and didn't he count, uh, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is very reminiscent of John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, the word was with God, and the word was God. There's a sense in which he experiences the attribute of being God, but he has existed in eternity past. Now, this wasn't actually um, uh, expounded on as much as it should have, honestly, but the, the Hebrews 1 pretty much did the job there. But yes, this is showing that Jesus as a divine person is distinguished from the father the god he's with and by implication this would be the son alongside his father in eternity past so, so, so just to so well, one second brandon yeah. can, can i ask a question just to clarify uh, well, so B, B, Ross, we, we can't do follow-up questions yeah yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, my bad my bad I was well, can i get can i get some sort of clarity on on what he said um, hang on we 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 can't be interrupting what 
the uh, speakers. Uh, Br- Brandon, go ahead. I would say looking at Philippians 2, I think to say that this is an instance of the eternal son would be reading more into the text and it's explicitly stating, I believe the instance that he's giving is his human life. Uh, this is the representation and it's saying that he was the more faith they you, which means simply he was the in the uh, form of, but it is not talking of hypostasis. So I would have issues concluding that this is an instance of the eternal Okay, I will remind everyone, please keep your questions under a minute. Okay, Jairus. Man, appreciate it. Definitely good to be in a good room where it's not a bunch of singing and stuff going on. So shout out to the moderators. Good job, Brandon. Good job, Isaiah. Um, And both of y'all can answer this question. I just, I don't know if you guys have mentioned the scripture because I've been in and out, but I wanted to, um, guys, to get your perspective on 1 John um, 5 and 7, where it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three um, are one. Well, um, and not that I don't speak for Isaiah, but I know this is probably one of the issues we probably agree on that because I'm probably not hitting at you on this year, it's because I'm not a KGB only. uh, I would definitely recognize that this wasn't a part of the original text. Uh, And I think the instance of uh, Erasmus uh, receiving the harassment to insert into the text would uh, be good ground. Uh, I believe the statement is true, but it is not to be found in the original manuscripts. That is not something found till the 16th century. Um, <coughs> I believe it's in the Latin Vulgate, but that's where that first appears. So, yeah, I actually agree with you. Okay, Christina, would you like to ask? Man, I missed that question. Okay. Uh, C- Christina, you sound a bit quiet. What about Hello? Is that Christina? better? Is that better? Nah, nah, it was better. Okay, thank y'all. All right, and um, my question is for Isaiah. In uh, Zechariah 12 and 10, um, the scripture says they will look. Let me, let me pull it up real quick. Um, in Zechariah 12 and 10, it says, and I, I, will, and I, will, I, will, pour out, I will pour out on the house of David and, and in the heavens of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child. So in the, that's the, in the NIV version. Um, who's speaking in this scripture right here? Is it the father? Is it the son? Who's speaking? This would be the son speaking because this very passage in John chapter 19 is applied to Jesus. So this would have to be the son because he was obviously the only one pierced. The father was not pierced at any time. The Bible never says such. I'm sure my opponent would beg to differ, but again, the one, the child, uh, the only child and the firstborn, these are all titles given of, of uh, Jesus. God gave his only son and Jesus is the prototokos. He's the firstborn of all creation. This would show that he has eternally been son. And also this would show that he was the one who was killed. It was not the father. Brandon. Yeah, uh, uh, again, I would say from a oneness uh, perspective, uh, more prophetic imagery showing the true incarnate work of the one true God in the man, Christ Jesus, uh, just like in Acts 20, 28, the uh, church of God that he shed for it with his own blood. We know it even uh, in a Trinitarian perspective, the second person of the Godhead doesn't have blood. In my instance, the one true God doesn't have blood. So uh, this would definitely be, in my understanding, a uh, representation of uh, the divine spirit incarnating incarnating in the true nature to be. Okay, Dr. Julio, would you like to. Uh, Dr. Julio, going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, N. Corny. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I can pronounce that too well, but would you like to ask a question? Hello, N. N. Corny. Okay, I don't think he's there either. Uh, Demi, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, is N. Corny here? My name is, well, you're talking to me, M. Uh, no, 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 sorry, um, you're, you're further down the queue or someone else. Uh, Demi, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I did. So the question I wanted to ask is, um, my understanding of your, your viewpoint, Brandon, is that the father 
in the incarnation took on flesh and assumed the role of the son. Um, if that's not correct, please stop me. Um, the question I want to ask is, if it is the case that the son only has a purpose and redemptive history and doesn't have an existence outside of it, then how can we have a true knowledge of who God is, right? The Trinitarian perspective is that God eternally existed as the Father, um, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But if I understand your worldview correctly, how can I know who God eternally is? Is it possible that he can assume other roles in future or has assumed other roles historically? And what then, by implication, limits the number of roles that the Father could potentially assume at any given time? Well, and that's a good question, uh, Demi. Uh, you unload a lot there. I'm not sure exactly how to answer in every instance, but I don't know if God has limitations as uh, far as uh, where he can be from a time and space aspect. But I do know in these last days he's spoken to us uh, through his son. Uh, so in that instance, I believe we can know who God is uh, by knowing who Jesus is. I would say that that that's another part of my opponent's position that's devastating because he does he doesn't believe that that God has eternally been the Father or the Son. He he said this. He said, and by the way, they're telling me that he hasn't eternally been the Father. He told me that before this debate. <clears throat> so that what is the limitation? How because he's described as Maker, Husband, Creator, uh, uh, just a Protector, the Rock. He's called a whole bunch of things. So why do we just limit it to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at that point? If we're just going to say these are modes and roles he takes on, he's taken on far more roles than three. And as I pointed out in my opening, I mean, I'm sorry, in my rebuttal, that ultimately the Godhead would have to be a creation under that view because it has it came into existence at creation. His fatherly and Okay, David, would you like to ask? Okay, I don't think David is here. Byron, would you like to ask a question? Sure, sure. I think this question can uh, kind of like go to to both. Uh, I'm going to bring up uh, Acts 7 and 55. And it said, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, he talked about looked up step, steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on uh, the right hand of God. I want to get you all uh, take the seat necessarily uh, what you all think about this, because uh, when I'm reading this, uh, um, it's not saying sometimes some people when I hear people tell they say oh he saw God and I'm like no it doesn't say that it says he saw the glory of God when we go to Hebrews we see that it says that that Christ is the uh, the brightness of his glory and I was wondering if you can uh, kind of chime in on that and not only uh, where it talks about what that right hand uh, it is because uh, we see that that he sees the glory of God you know which you know which could mean probably something or whatever Stephen probably was saying when he was saying this, but also what you take what this right hand means that he was standing on the right hand uh, of the glory of God. Okay, I, I could take that first. So, uh, um, yeah, so Acts chapter 7, verse 55, very interesting passage because it says, uh, but he full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So I would say that this is in terms of proximity and just the very distinction of the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And also keep in mind in verse 55, it says he's full of the Holy Spirit too. So I would say that this is a display of the whole, of, of the whole, uh, the whole Godhead. And then the follow-up verse says, and he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. So if you see the son of man standing at the right hand of God, that's distinguishing the son of man from the God he's with. But the Son of Man is divine himself, because as, as he just said, he is the radiance and glory of God. So if the Son of Man is, a, is divine and the God he's next to is divine, that, that's... Well, uh, and 
Oh, I'm sorry. And I'll respond to this by agreeing with the aspect of that. Yes, uh, Stephen is having a vision because he is full of the Holy Ghost, which kind of gives us more spirit language. And we know he said, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. We definitely don't believe uh, that no one uh, that he was literally looking up into the first heavens. And then right then he was saying that he's having a vision of these things. And also uh, what makes it very interesting is that he's standing on the right hand of the glory of God. Now, if we're uh, understanding this to mean that, of course, this is the right hand, we have to ask some questions. How big is the hand that's standing next to him? Uh, I think when we deal with the idea of God being uh, having this proximity thing, I think we have a big misunderstanding. And furthermore, this couldn't be an example of the Trinity because he didn't even mention the Holy Ghost. And in verse of uh, uh 59 and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. If there were three there, I think it would have been quite rude to only speak to. Okay, Mark, would you like to ask? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for letting me ask a question. Shout out to the moderators and both speakers. You guys did a really, really, really good job. Very enjoyable. Uh, my question is to Isaiah. The question is, um, how many churches are there and whose church is it? I'll give two verses um, just for a point of reference. In Matthew 16 and 18, it states, and I say un and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is Christ speaking in that uh, reference there. In Acts 20 and verse 28, it states, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood, the church of God. So we have Christ saying it's his church. We have God saying it's church of God. How many churches are there, Isaiah? And whose church? Uh, I would just say that <clears throat> the God has one global church, but there's also many, many churches between that. Then you have the seven churches in Revelation. You have a, a whole bunch, really. Uh, so it, it depends how you're looking at it. But yes, there's one global church because there's one body, the church. And um, I, I would I, I want to give reference to a church father. Uh, so I have um, it, uh, Ignatius. Uh, this, this is Ignatius. I know this isn't really the direction I was going, but just to help answer this question. Uh, so Ignatius was called. This is in his epistle to the Ephesians. It says uh, Ignatius was called uh, Theophorus uh, to the church, which is at Ephesus in Asia, deservedly so much, uh, deservedly most happy uh, being blessed in the greatness and fullness of God, the Father, and predestined before the beginning of time, that it should be always for an enduring and unchangeable glory, being united and elected through the uh, true passion of, by the will of the Father and Jesus Christ, our God, abundant happiness uh, G through Jesus Christ and his undefiled grace. This is the people who are set aside before the foundation of the earth and called to be him. So we are one global church, one global body. Uh, and by the way, I I'm saying this for the, the Trinitarians, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, yeah, uh, that's one global body, many other churches covered by the. Okay. M, would you like to ask a question? Wait, I think uh, Brandon. Gets oh, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so sorry, Brandon. Would you like to comment on that? <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, I believe, of course, that this is the church that he shed with his own blood. I believe uh, it was God in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So I believe to say that this is the church. It is the church of Jesus. Okay, M, would you now like to ask you? I'm just grateful for just listening spending my Saturday night with you guys. Okay, well, uh, thank you for the uh, kind comments then. Um, Tim, would you like to ask a question? I thought you'd never ask, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just a quick one. Um, so in regards to the Trinity, I mean, you know, I'm kind of perplexed at how three can be one. You know, um, for me, this kind of goes down to the, uh, you know, um, polytheist sort of, uh, um, you know, side of things. But so let me just, because I've asked my friend, right, about the Trinity, he's Christian, and he said, imagine it to be like solid, liquid, and gas, basically. He explained it like that, right? But the thing is this, like water can be in the form of liquid, ice, or steam, right? Much like you've seen, like, in 
you know, everyday life or whatever. Like, but the thing is this, why, like, while I do see that, like, the mass of water can have, like, three distinct, like, separate states or whatever the case may be, I don't understand how this, like, can explain the Trinity, right? Because, all right, let's, let's, for example, let's say we take a pot, we fill it up, one litre of water, and then, you know, that's liquid, now we put it in the freezer, then it becomes solid, then we put it in, you know, uh, in a pot, and then obviously that turns into steam or whatever the case may be, like, like the like if this is like to be used is as it, an is analogy question, is, uh, yeah, hold on. no no no, no. We, it's, we not it's not a question it's not a question it's, yeah there's a question in it there towards the end i just well, want uh, to speed up please tim i mean i mean you can't speed up you know the word of god it's a one minute it's a one minute question tim if you don't know oh my bad my bad my bad all right let me let me let me let me let me cut it short then and just and just kind of say it right um for me the thing is this if you if you kind of like base it down to that analogy right it, it's contradicting right about god for example like does that one kg of water like simultaneously exist like one one kilogram of liquid one kilogram of solid and then one kilogram of steam no it doesn't because the christian god supposedly well, okay was that was that are you just answering it, that? oh Can my god all right you know what I'll, uh, I'm okay. sorry, All right, Tim. So perfect. But, I got the question. Yeah, uh, if you'd like to make any comments on what was yeah, said yes. there, I don't think there was a question. But maybe... yeah, yeah. Uh, so no, I don't believe that solid, liquid, and gas is analogous to the Trinity. That that's much more analogous of modalism, actually. But uh, no, I think it's poor because now you have okay. Well, he can't be all these states at once, so it's a poor analogy even there. In the case of the Trinity, and this this isn't even actually relevant to the topic of the discussion, but just since it came up. No, uh, there's no 100% analogy to the Trinity. What is what it is is that God is one in one sense and multiple in another sense. So, again, the God is three persons, but he's one being. This, uh, so, too, with you can be one in many. This actually resolves the problem of the one in the many. This is why the triune God of Scripture is the true God. Not just because of this, obviously, but uh, they, this is one of the reasons, I should say. So, again, look at the number three. Three is one thing, but it's also three things. It's one a uh, one univocal thing, but it's also three things. And then between each number, you have infinites. So this shows how a multiplicity and a and a um a unification has to be possible. This is what this is what the issue of the one and the many is. This is what we're talking about. This is what God resolves. Uh, as far as is water, solid, liquid, and gas analogous? No, because that's a ridiculous. Brandon. Well, I will definitely say uh, that we do see uh, the the problem of the Trinity to have a, a highly intelligent young man believing that three means one and one means three. Uh, but I will say uh, that I wasn't quite sure on the context of uh, what he was asking, but uh, he that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I know that's water uh, analogy there, but I think one to saying Trinitarians get into problems when we uh, try to make analogies. Uh, but I will affirm uh, his question by saying that God has consistently identified. Him. Okay, King, would you like to make? Sure thing. I just want to say a good. Seconds. Hello. Uh, can no, no, I was out? saying. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you now. Okay, I did step away for a second. So if this question has already been asked, then forgive me. I was just curious, though, and perhaps Brandon could go first on um, Acts seven fifty five with the vision of Stephen. Again, if it's already been asked, forgive me. I stepped away for a second, so just I need help reconciling that, right? Because it appears to be an illustration of the Godhead. But I'm not so sure. So if anyone can address that, if, if it's already been addressed, you can disregard. Well, I try to give my understanding. And again, verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, I believe this is a uh, vision language or indicating he's going into the spirit. And he said uh, and say the and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. One God. This is anthropomorphism. God doesn't have hands and elbows and knees and ankle bones and all of those various things. Him standing uh, on the right hand, I believe this is symbolic of the work of Jesus Christ. But again, my understanding is that verse 59, 
and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So uh, my conclusion to that will be that this is uh, Stephen praying to the one true God. And furthermore, he didn't uh, acknowledge the father or the Holy uh, so this is where I have to, I'm actually glad that this came back up because my uh, my friend here, he didn't address what the first part of the verse says. It says, but he full of the Holy Spirit. So there's your Holy Spirit right there. He's filled with the Holy Spirit as he does this. He doesn't have to, uh, he doesn't have to say it because it says the Spirit searches the heart. What, what is too deep for words, right? So he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he's seeing God. He's seeing the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now you have the full Trinity here. You have him being filled with the Spirit. He's seeing the glory of God, which would be the Father, and Jesus, the Son of Man, standing at the right hand of God. That is the full Trinity in scope. Thank you for bringing Okay, Wayne, last but not least, would you like to ask? Yes, I would. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Okay, so this question is for Brandon. Um, okay, so in the second temple period, around like 500 BC, the Jewish priestly order, they discovered or they found out or they realized that in Daniel chapter 7 you have the ancient of days and you have this figure called the son of man then there was a spinoff of different um, explanations for who this son of man is uh, some thought it was Adam some thought it was Elijah some thought it was Moses so it seems like in the second temple period the exp the explanations they were trying to make for who this person was was an exalted human separate from the ancient of days or who Christians call God the Father. So my question to you, Brandon, is do you have any second temple manuscript to show that um, one of those explanations was a oneness explanation or that the ancient of days, or I'm sorry, that the Son of Man is also the ancient of days? So do, like, do you have a manuscript or anything from like the second temple period to showcase your point of view was even an explanation around that point. Well, um, then that's a good question, Wayne. It's good to see you again. I, to your question, I don't have any manuscripts on me. I'm fresh out of those. Uh, but as it relates to the second temple uh, period, Judaism with Philo and all of those guys, it seems like you would give me a two powers in heaven question. I don't, I got Alan F. Siegel's book in here somewhere, but I lost count probably around chapter five, how many times he called uh, this minority view that developed in the light of uh, Jewish Hellenism of a second power, maybe Metatron or one of these deities being another one. But based on the context of uh, Daniel seven, I see no reason to conclude that there uh, was a second uh, two power. And furthermore, even if there was a minority of Jews who believed that, which most likely it was, just like we know there were Jews who believed a lot of things they shouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't take that as a, uh, a proof to uh, assert a belief in a second. Uh, I would just say in addition, to, well, not in, in contrast to that, uh, that was an excellent question because that shows the two power doctrine did exist even back then. This is a pre, a pre, uh, pre Reformation, pre Nicaea, pre Christ view that God was multi personal. This shows that this is uh, this was the explanation. The the re the real reality is when this was never looked at as the explanation. This is why in Alan of Siegel's book, as was just mentioned, we do see that this view existed, and also uh, the bodies of God by Benjamin Summers. That, that's another fantastic book about the subject in which God is described as multi-personal. Oneness did not use that. We see from, from uh, what we read in Daniel that there is the son, of, uh, the son of Man and the Ancient of Days. Now, I do believe the Son of Man does experience the quality of being the Ancient of Days. However, I do, uh, I'm saying in the context of Daniel, there's no reason to believe that Son of Man and Ancient of Days are identical at that point. So later on, it's like when it says that there's one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. That's not to say that the Father isn't Lord or Jesus isn't God, but in the context, it distinguishes them. Not to mention the early church rejected Sabellianism out the gate. Uh, notice of Smyrna, Praxius, uh, Sabellius, they were all cast out as heresies. This only recently re uh, revived in the 20th century, the modern-day one is Pentecostal movement. Okay, now we'll be moving on to five minute closing statements. So, Brandon, let me know when you would like me to start your.
Well, uh, you can start right now. Uh, I will want to say first again that I appreciate the opportunity to come on to the Christian Apologetics uh, platform, Faithful Alexander Isaiah. You have uh, served as the uh, pristine example of uh, cordial discussion and uh, wanted to make sure I readily acknowledge that in front of the audience. Uh, don't want to seem to be ungrateful for that. I will say that I could believe I have uh, stated and restated my position well enough that we believe there exists eternally one God who is the father who has revealed himself in his son and come uh, to be the Holy ghost within our hearts. Uh, I will give this conclusion as it relates to the two powers in heaven idea, as far as a historical uh, reasoning, because if there's anything that should draw doubt to the doctrine of the Trinity, I believe studying church history was the uh, nail in the coffin to do it. Uh, as it relates to the church rejecting uh, oneness, I would uh, definitely say, we need to go back and look into that because just like I wouldn't use a oneness writer to reference Trinitarians, I think it's academically dishonest uh, or probably not as consistent to use our opposition or maybe those who were said to. We're not sure because we don't have their writings. But as it relates to Second Temple period Judaism, uh, Helen F. Siegel in his book, I've forgot the amount of times just in the preface that he called this a heretical view. This seems very odd language for something that, as uh, Michael Heisel will postulate, was mainline Judaism. But again, uh, I have a simple position. Uh, it doesn't take multiple councils to come up with it. We just go back to the book of scripture and I believe it'll lead us to the fullness of God. And with that, I say thank you. Okay, and Isaiah, let me know when you would like me to start your five-minute closing statement. So, as I said in the beginning, and as well as I <clears throat> have said, I will say now, praise be to the God and Father of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the power of His glorious Holy Spirit. All praises be to the triune God of the Scripture. Um, I would just say that uh, the questioners, uh, thank you all. Thank you to the moderators. Thank you to of course, my opponent, um, Brandon Nero, this has been a very respectful debate and it got out information, which is the, well, second main point of this. And of course, the main, main point is to glorify the triune God of scripture. So uh, I would like to say that, uh, w let's review what happened in this debate. So there was never any justification for how the speaker of Hebrews 1 verses uh, seven through eight changed in speakers. There was never any justification whatsoever. It was by mere assertion. There was never justification for how the son could be the exact imprint of the father's hypostasis, but the son himself not be eternal. There was never any justification for how Jesus could have equality with God, but there was no other divine person for him to be present with. There was no justification for why we are to abide in a creature, which is what first John chapter two, verse 24 would have to be saying from the oneness view. Uh, likewise, the two powers doctrine, um, I, I would definitely respectfully disagree that it was, it was in fact the majority view. Alan F. Siegel was biased in his understanding because he's of the Unitarian persuasion of Judaism. It became the, the minority view after the second century AD, but prior to that, no. Um, there was no justification for any of the things that, that are supposed to be looked at as the father, be, uh, as the father being Jesus. There was nothing that could prove this. It was just, well, omnipresence. Uh, I don't see why we necessarily have to go with the Trinity here. Uh, I don't like the fact that God can have a God. Uh, well, it says right here, the, the God created and, and the, the Son created, and they, they fathered here, so that would make Jesus the Father. Equivocation, as I all pointed out in my opening statement. So the conclusion here, folks, is that there is no actual justification for oneness theology. Oneness theology is an idolatrous position that does put a creature in the place of God, and it does have all of creation worshiping him alongside the true God. And we have a creature being worshiped alongside the true God. And likewise, we have the denial of the son and therefore the denial of the father. My opponent has admitted he does not believe in eternal fatherhood, let alone eternal sonship. So that this, this view cannot stand. This is unheard of to the, to the Bible. The early church easily dismissed this as heresy. This is one of the oldest Christological heresies after Gnosticism and maybe Ebionism. It's the oldest Christological heresy, and it was recognized as such because if you don't have the multiplicity of God's persons, then you don't have any justification 
for all the things that are happening when they're distinguished. You have to have either idolatrous worship or you have to have lying on the part of God. Either way, we've seen that that's what one does have. Now, I respect Brandon Nero. I'm not calling him a liar or a dishonest person, but I say repent from this and come and embrace the triune God of Scripture. Praise be to the God and Father of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit. Okay, well with that I'd like to thank everyone who has attended, watched and participated in the debate. I thank you uh, the moderators uh, with me, Faithful, and also the participants in the debate, Brandon and Isaiah, for giving up their time to participate in this debate. So thank you everyone for being here and I'd like to thank God for bringing us all together and I pray that this debate helped us glorify his name and bring out the truth of scripture to many and that truth will be revealed to those who have listened.